Have you danced with a cubit lately? I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Dr. Bob Suter, author and vice president for IBM Quantum Ecosystem Development. Welcome, Bob. Hi. Uh, glad to be back, Tanya. Absolutely. Wonderful having you back. So what is the mission of IBM Quantum? So IBM Quantum uh, develops quantum computing systems. Um, uh, people have heard about quantum computers, I think, for a, for a long time. Uh, I, I think this word quantum is associated with science fiction in many people's minds. But, but really, for almost four years now, we have had quantum computers on the cloud. Uh, we've had over 210,000 people register. And, and here's a statistic I, I, I love. Uh, if you think about how much work that people have actually done, how many computations have been done on IBM quantum computers, we're now up to about 75 billion computations. So for those who think, oh, you know, we're just getting started with quantum computing, it's really early days. And, um, we're, as I said, four years into this and we're working with clients on use cases. Um, I do caution though, it's gonna be several years before quantum computers working together with our classical computers can do things better than classical computers can alone. But I think we're making great progress. I am going to want to get into that, but first I, I want to talk to you about your book. So you just wrote uh, a book on quantum computing titled Dancing with Qubits, How Quantum Computing Works and How It Can Change the World. Why did uh, you write the, why did you write the well, book? Well, coincidentally, I happen to have one here. Um, in fact, this is my only copy, so I keep an eye on it. Um, well, first, quantum computing is um, growing importance as a technology, as, as we, IBM, and others are developing quantum computers. So, so we're fairly early in the development of this new technology. So personally, for my, me to think about, well, if I were to write a book, if I were to devote uh, what ended up being hundreds of hours writing a book, I wanted something that was timely and that you know, had a shelf life of, of some sort. Um, now, the second reason was, is that it seemed to me that many of the quantum computing books um, lived at, at one of two extremes. So either it was very high level and would talk about these great concepts, and unfortunately, it would sacrifice a lot of, let me say, correctness. So you'd feel really good, you would think you understood what it was, and really you didn't. <laughs> Right, but you know, so so it was very high level. At the other extreme, there were books that saying this is perfect to you. It's completely rigorous. It has everything you need to know, and of course, you do have three years of college physics as well. It seemed to me there had to be something in the middle, and so that's what I aim for with this book. Something that was comfortable to read. Yes, you have to do some math, but I bring you along with it so that. You, you, you learn the technology, and once you get through this, then you can move on to the harder texts, or maybe even read uh, some research articles if you're interested in financial services, for example. That's going to be an early application, we believe, for quantum computing. You can start reading some of the research papers then. D to your point, um, to elaborate on that, Dancing with Qubits is, is more than a book. In fact, <laughs> it's over 480 pages, okay? It, it's like a mini encyclopedia, if you will. It starts with simple math and basic computer science and then supernovas into advanced math and quantum theory. So mm -hmm. what job titles did you write this book for? So originally I had the idea, let me tell you, when I first started writing this book that in my mind was going to be 300 pages long, I was thinking, well, you know, anybody who had a good high school education right? Uh, enough math, not calculus, but people who could, you know, knew that much could go into it. Um, my editor suggested that maybe that was a little over ambitious, um, but still, um, there are a lot of people I have learned who are very interested in learning more about quantum computing, but don't know where to start. And it can be confusing because you start reading one thing, you hit a concept you don't understand, you have to jump someplace else. And that leads you to something else and you forgot about what you were doing in the first place. And so it can be very frustrating. So the length isn't so much related to the number of topics, though, though there are a broad range of, of topics. It's about the pacing. And so I imagine, you know, if you and I were to be standing uh, next to a whiteboard 
and we were just talking about examples and we were working through some of the math and you know we'd stay as long as you want uh, on these things um, until we got got through them I also tried to make it very conversational because in truth look I'm not a quantum computing person from way back I am a mathematician but I myself had to learn a lot of this material so I was thinking, what were my aha moments? Where did it click, <laughs> right? And when that happened, I tried to put that in the book because if I was wondering, perhaps other people were as well. Makes sense. In fact, I would say my question then would be, um, as far as the future goes, for those experienced in programming classical computers today, how mm -hmm. does programming quantum a quantum computer differ? Is it a matter of, extending existing knowledge or are there things you have to unlearn from classical to get quantum right? Well, it will become easier in time. Let me, let me say that. Now, now that's, um, that, that's truthfully not a very deep statement because most things get easier in time. But uh, let me give you kind of a comparison. Um, way back um, 30 or 40 years ago, if you were to take a traditional programming class, you would learn C, you might learn assembly language. That is, you would learn how to code very close to the machine. And you'd worry about how do I access memory? What's a register and things like this. Now at this point, we have very high level languages. We have things like Python, we have Swift, uh, C Sharp, Java, of course, many things like that. So it's much easier and you go in and you try to figure out what your problem is. You look at the libraries, how, how are things already implemented? You look at open source. And so it's much easier to code these days. So with quantum, on one hand, we are a little bit farther back. You have to start at a lower level. You have to know not so much what the hardware is, but the model by which the hardware operates. And these are gates and circuits, same as for classical, except they're different gates and the circuits work in very different ways. So your classical, knowledge helps you, but there are a number of gotchas with quantum that there are, are no analogies back in the quantum world, and, and um, it can lead you astray. Um, Jay Gambetta, who's the head of the IBM Quantum Program at IBM Research, several years ago um, coined this phrase, which was, you're thinking too classically. So you may make mistakes, but you'll wake up the next morning and realize your error and, and move on. So it's a different way of thinking. It's not version four of anything. It's different, but you'll get the hang of it. In several places throughout the book, you mentioned, and you even alluded to this earlier, that the promise offered or, or threat posed by quantum is still a number of years off. But mm -hmm. in a discussion on quantum cryptography, you encourage action now to prepare mm -hmm. that far off day. Explain that. So, so let me give one example. So people talk about um, what's, what's called Shor's algorithm. And it's an algorithm for factoring large integers. Well, most people, frankly, once you get out of high school, you, you stop factoring numbers. Yes, you learn that 12 is three times four, <laughs> right? And 1,000 is 10 times 10 times 10. And then you get on with your life, really, right? Uh, well, there are some of our cryptographic protocols that are based on very large numbers that it's assumed that they're very hard to factor into their pieces. And those individual pieces are related to the keys by which I would encrypt the message. And if you are the intended person for the message, you would decrypt it. So should someone be able to factor this, then we got a problem. Then you know, the, the, cryptographically, someone could break it and see the information. Now, here's the rub though. Right now, we have a quantum computer with 53 what we call physical qubits. The estimates of the number of physical qubits you would need to do such factoring in our systems that are used today are on the order of 30 million. 53 versus 30 million. So that might say it's not gonna happen tomorrow, right? We, we got a ways to go. There's, there's a lot to figure out between now and 30 million. But if we assume <laughs> that through the years, we in fact do develop much more powerful quantum computers and, and we have to be careful you know, what we mean by powerful. 
But you know, quantum computers that potentially are big enough to do that, what are the implications? Well, the implications are if I encrypt data today and someone could break into it, let's say 30 years from now, is that a problem? And the answer is frequently yes. Personal information, healthcare information. Uh, there are rules and regulations in different countries around the world related to this. So while you may not be that concerned in the next few weeks or months about quantum getting into any of your information, it's important to move to a protocol, a cryptographic protocol, that can't be broken, even if that's many years down the line. All right, Bob, how does someone get a copy of your book? Well, it's available on Amazon. It's available through the publisher Pact. Um, it is in hard copy, just to, to show you one more time. It's about an inch and a quarter thick, not too bad. Um, and it is available in the Kindle version, uh, which came out several weeks ago. Um, and um, they're, they're equally beautiful in, in, from my perspective, uh, but um, any way you want it. And if you'd like to contact me, if you have questions about it, uh, I'm available on LinkedIn, and there's even a Facebook page for Dancing with Cubits. I even have a Facebook page, Bob. <laughs> I, went a little over, I, even, I went a little overboard in one weekend. <laughs> I was reading something about social media, and, and so I, I gave it a Facebook page. Next I, thing you know, you're going to be on TikTok. Well, outside of, well, no, well, no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> My son again. would love to I'm sure, I'm sure. Thanks again. That's Dr. Bob Suter, author and vice president of IBM Research for IBM Quantum Ecosystem Development. If you want to get a copy of Box. Bob's book, Dancing with Cubits. I highly recommend it. It's a great read and certainly somebody interested in quantum computing. And find more of my interviews right here or go to tonyahall.net. Thanks for watching.